everything. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. It's always good to remember Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and the cost that it took to purchase our lives, to purchase our souls, to give us the freedom that we so enjoy in Christ. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to remember. And I'm glad that the Lord left behind this wonderful supper for us to remember him. Well, we're going through the book of Genesis, and if you remember last week, we started on Joseph, who's going to take up 25% of the book of Genesis, and for good reason. He's a great example of who Jesus will eventually become. He's the perfect shadow, really, of Christ in so many ways, and we'll bring that out. And then in the middle of all of that comes chapter 38, which is a story about Judah and Tamar. Judah, one of the sons of Jacob or Israel, during the time that Joseph gets incarcerated and taken away, there are things happening among the family. And, and so the scripture and the Holy Spirit himself has seen fit to put down this little story, which is a little crazy. And as you're reading through the scriptures, it's almost like a hiccup in the middle of the life of Joseph. How many of you are familiar with this story? Okay, very good. So I can go home. Good. <laughs> well, we're gonna pick it up from last week where we looked at Joseph. We were introduced to this 17-year-old who has dreams he has delusions of grandeur, some would say, his brothers would say. And he has this great dream that all, these, all of his brothers will bow down to him. And he has another dream where the sun, the moon, and all the 11 stars, it's interesting, there's only 11, will bow down to him. And his father understands what that means. And he says, are you saying that your mother and I and all your brothers are going to bow down to you? He starts to wonder if he should have had that coat made for him or not. If maybe that put him over the top. And uh, added to his arrogance, uh, or, or certainly his courage of a 17-year-old, to share all of his heart with his parents and his brothers who hate him. And so we've gotten to see his life. His brothers see him from far away. He's coming to check up on them, which is uh, what his dad told him to do. Set this son up for failure and uh, put the youngest over the oldest. And we're not going to hear the last of that for a little while in the scriptures. And he says, go check on your brothers. As he goes there, he finds them, and they say, let's kill this kid. You may have felt like killing your sibling, but they actually planned it. <laughs> and some cooler heads prevailed. Reuben said, let's, let's not kill him. We'll have blood on our hands. He's our brother. Let's just put him in a pit. And Reuben figured, I'll come back later and, and pull him out. And it, it could have been three days where he was in there. And we see later on in chapter 48 where he explains how all of the hardships are happening to this family because they did what they did to Joseph. And it's interesting how Reuben brings that out. He goes, I, he says, this is all happening because of Joseph. He was crying out from the pit and we didn't even listen. And because we've done this thing, that's why God is against us. And so all of this begins to happen with Joseph. Finally, Reuben he decides, listen, I'm sorry, Judah says, let's not kill him. And why should we just throw him in a pit and let him die? Let's make some money off this kid. And they sell him off as a slave to a caravan that's on its way to Egypt. And of course, just so happens that God allowed that caravan to come by so that Joseph wouldn't die. And Joseph gets taken as a prisoner. And away goes Joseph. And so... He's now with the Midianites. He's sold to Egypt to Potiphar, who's an officer of Pharaoh. He's the captain of the guard. He's basically the head executioner. That's what his job. I don't know if you could imagine having that job, um, but back then what they would do is just cut your head off. So he's the head executioner. He's not the guy that you want to mess with, and he's, he probably looks rather menacing. Um, so he's the head officer, and it's, he's labeled later as a eunuch, and you guys know what a eunuch is. He's not all there, but it's much more of a position. It's much more of a position for him than it is necessarily a biological function. So when we get there, 
we'll discuss it. And so he goes from hero to zero. He was all that in a bag of chips with his brothers and his dad, and now he's nobody. And Jesus himself made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient even at the death on the cross. We see that Joseph is a picture of Jesus, how God sent him to the earth to be our servant, to be our teacher, and ultimately to be the sacrifice to shed his blood and his body was given so that we might have new life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So this week, we're going to look at Judah and Tamar. Uh, Judah, one of the sons who's been pretty good up to this point, we're going to now travel with him. If you remember Simeon and Levi, uh, they're already guilty of mass murder. We see Reuben uh, sleeping with his father's wife. And so from the eldest on down, you start to see these people being disqualified to carry a blessing or to be outstanding in the family. And now we come to Judah, who happens to be the next in line in age. And we're going to be given a story. This is a very stark contrast to the life of Joseph. And it's just one chapter where Joseph's gone. He goes to Egypt. He's going to be there for about 22 years, separated from his family. And while this is happening, we get a little eye on what's happening back with the family, with Judah. It begins in verse 1. And it came to pass at the time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adullamite, whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her. And so she conceived and bore a son and called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He must have been expecting a girl. <laughs> he was, and he was at Chezeb when she bore him. Begins with a tragedy. <laughs> You have a son who's leaving his family and he's going among the Canaanites, which they were told not to. Among the people who worship idols, among the people who do detestable things. And so here's a, here's a good kid, grew up in a good family. We would say today in this day and age, grew up in a good Christian family, although they were somewhat dysfunctional. And he's now wandering out into the world of the Canaanites. And he goes and he makes a pagan pal. His pagan pal is Hiram. There's this danger of isolating. He pulls himself away from his family. He pulls himself away from the fellowship and the accountability of his brothers to go and do his own thing. And he goes in the direction of the Canaanites. And if you remember back in all the pre previous stories, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, nobody wanted to marry the women of this land because they were all idol worshipers. They were all encouraged to go find a good girl. How many parents have told your kids that? Find, find a good girl. My goodness, don't, you know, don't go scraping the bottom of the barrel. Nobody wants that. But he isolates. The first thing it is, he leaves his brother. So that's not always a good thing, is it? To be isolated. The scripture is pretty clear in Proverbs 18, 1 and 2. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. You see, this individualism, this sort of rebellion that's in all of our hearts because we're all fallen sinners, this isolating is not good. And the scripture tells us that we're in Christ, in Jesus Christ, in the church, we're all part of one another. And we're accountable to one another. We're all part of one another. And one of the first things I did as a young Christian, if I wanted to go back into my old lifestyle, which was sordid and nasty, I would not go to church because I didn't want to hear the word of God. Any of you, any of you ever do that? Pull back. Uh, don't open the word. You're not in devotions. You're not hanging out with your Christian friends. You're not doing any of that. You just, you kind of say, I had enough. I'm going to take a break for a little while. 
And it's one of the first signs of somebody isolating to do whatever the heck it is that they want to do. And I've been that person and I've also known those people. And sometimes they never come back. And the first part is isolating. You pull back and you disassociate. And at that point, you're like a sheep that's left the flock. And that's the one that the wolf finds. So isolation is not a good thing. In Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, we're exhorted by the apostle. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. By the way, that's why we need each other. Because you guys stir me up. <laughs> and hopefully I stir you up. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. That is the day of Jesus Christ. The day when he comes down, he says, I'm taking all my toys and we're going home. All the more we should be on guard. All the more because of the condition of our world. Amen? Amen. All the more because the condition of what's happening out there can easily stain us as we soak in the, in the, the, the mixture of the world. And so... This is hugely important for us to be among God's people. And not just on Sunday, but by the way, we have things going on all during the week. We have a picnic that's coming up. We have a potluck that's coming up. We have a host of things that are happening here. And it's designed to cause us to gather together more often. We have prayer meeting on Wednesday, Bible study on Thursday, men's breakfast and women's breakfast on Saturday mornings. All of this is not to put on your to-do calendar. Oh, there's one more thing I got to do. That's not it. It's an opportunity for fellowship and to get to know each other. Because right now, as you're staring back at me and I'm talking to you, we don't have an even exchange of thoughts. I realize that. And so we try to make opportunity for that to happen. And that's why we have so many things going on. Sign-up sheets are out in the hall. It's an instant commercial. There it is. <laughs> Please sign up. Because we're going to have a blast and we're going to get to know each other and don't be afraid. We're all as broken as you are. Amen. Number two, there's a danger in exposure. It says that he visited a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. He's making friends with the world. He has a pagan pal where he could go, maybe hang out. Whatever it is that you might do with a pagan friend. Fill in the blank. He separates from his brothers and he goes out on his own and he finds one of the pagans of the land and he's now exposed to this idol-worshiping nation. And you know the pressure of conforming to the image of the people you spend time with. You become like the people you spend time with, which is why you want to pick good people. And when your kids are growing up and they're hanging out with the riffraff of the neighborhood, you go, don't you spend time with them. And they say, get a life, dad. <laughs> because I don't want you to look like them. I don't want you to do like them. And so be careful whom you choose as your friends because you will become like them. In Ecclesiastes 10, 8 to 10, it's this interesting verse. It says, he who digs a pit may fall into it. And one who breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. One who quarries stones may be injured by them. One who splits logs may be endangered by them. If an iron axe that is blunt and the workman does not sharpen its edge, he must exert a great deal of effort so wisdom has the advantage of giving success. How many of you confused? None of you. That's good. I'll just move on. The, the thing is, if you expose yourself to certain dangerous situations, something could happen, right? Right? I remember buying a motorcycle and somebody said, well, how's that going to be when you fall? And I said, I don't plan on falling. He says, no one ever does. He says, it's not a matter of if you will fall, it's when. And I thought about that and said, I'll take my chances. That's what Judah is saying here. I'm going to take my chances. I think I'm okay. I'm all right. I can handle this situation. I mean, I'm sure I can walk into a go-go bar and everything will be fine. Or I can walk into this tavern on Friday night by myself 
and I'm sure I won't be tempted to drink at all. I'm sure that I could join this party or I could go over this situation or that situation. It'll be okay. I'm sure everything... Listen, if you dig a pit, you could fall into it, right? If you're going to cut wood, you might get injured by the wood. If you're going to break apart a wall, you might get bitten by a snake. It's just the fact that you're exposed to that danger. And it's a good idea to avoid danger before it finds you. Because at that point, you get forced into a decision and under pressure, you may make the wrong decision. So I make sure that there are certain places I don't go, certain people I don't talk about and hang around with and see, and certain places I just don't go. And there's stuff I just won't do. I just say, no, thank you. I've had, I've had friends invite me to go to a concert, like a worldly concert, not a Christian concert, and I know what's going to happen there. There's going to be people getting high and getting stoned and offering me drugs and all this other... And, I think I'll miss, I could, I could pull it up on YouTube, easy enough. I don't have to put myself in that situation. So be careful, because Judah is entering into a land here that I'm not sure he knows what's about to happen to him. And there's a danger of infatuation. The scripture says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Amen. Guard your heart, because it is the wellspring of life, it says in another version. Be careful what you set your affections on because what you set your affections on end up being the path you travel at some point. And so the things that I see on the internet, I can't unsee. The things that I entertain. You ever see somebody on their phone and they're shopping and you say, what are you looking for? They go, nothing. <laughs> well, what are you looking at? Shoes. You need shoes? No. You're going to buy some? Probably. Probably. Because that's what happens. What do you got, Amazon there? <laughs> Guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. I want to make sure that I, I'm careful about what I see, what I listen to, how I, where I go. All of that's important because it will mold my heart. I mean, I'm driving my car and I go by a car lot and I go, wow, look at that car. I go buy another car lot and I go, oh, look at that car. That's nice. Look at that. The next thing, you're pulling over and you're checking the price. Right? For me, it's driving by a bakery. Going. <laughs> <sighs> Bread. I don't look. I mean, I go to, there's a bakery. I got to go this way. It's the other way. Or you go to Costco, you know, you got to stay out of the, oh, you can understand this. Okay, good. <laughs> Irrelevant, okay. Yeah, there's the whole baked area, and, it's, and it smells delicious, you know. And I don't know why they put the concession right there at the end of the grocery, you know, where you're going out through the registers. Well, I, I guess I do know, because the pizza sounds good, and the hot dogs look good. And, you know, you got to get a parfait. Everybody loves a parfait. So I want to guard my heart. So before going into Costco, I determine what I'm going to do, what I'm going to purchase, and I make sure I don't deviate from the plan. I do that so I can glorify God. I do that so I won't be 265 pounds again. In Malachi 2, 15 to 16, he goes into this. Did the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Notice, same term. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, for the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. So when I read that passage, I know that there are certain things I shouldn't look at. There are certain places I don't go. There are certain things I just don't do because I don't want my heart to chase after another woman when I've committed myself to the one that God's given me. Amen? Amen. It's the same thing with temptation. Whether it be baked goods at Costco or whether it be your marriage, to protect those things means you guard your heart so that your affections don't chase after things that you should not have. 
And sometimes that's how we get involved in temptation, right? We toy with the idea, gee, that would that'd be nice. Look at that car. That'd be nice. A Ferrari. Wouldn't that be great? Well, it won't be long if I let my heart go that I'm going to sell everything I own to buy it. It's not worth it. So, I'll figure out how to work this one day. He departs from his brothers. And it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and he visited a certain Adullamite. And why am I doing this? And he gives birth. He finds a woman. Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. By the way, Shua isn't the girl he found. Shua is her father. I know. I found lots of pastors that didn't know this. Shua is a male name. It's hard, but. It, it's like what, when somebody from New York says yes. Shua. <laughs> hey, people. Judah saw that there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her. Actually, the scripture doesn't say he married her. It says he took her. It's been dressed up a little. So she conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Ur. You know, you got to watch out what happens when you're giving birth because it seems like that's what you get named after. All these people, like, like Esau, red and hairy. We'll call him Harry because he's red and hairy. Esau. This is Ur. Uh, she conceived again and bore a son and called his name Onan because he was a barbarian. And she, and she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Sheila because they were hoping for a girl. And he was at... She was at Chezib when she bore him. So she instantly gives birth to three sons. Now, obviously, time goes on, and these things are happening in time. We're reading a chapter, which is going to encompass a number of years. So he has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shela. Wonderful. So he's not only did he soak in the Canaanite world, but he saw himself a Canaanite cutie and said, I want you, you're mine. And she gets pregnant three times, has three offspring. It's interesting because after this chapter, you don't hear about Judah anymore. The story of Judah ends in chapter 48, where there are prophecies given over them as to the future. And it's remarkable and prophetic. And we'll talk about that. But this, he's basically running his family into the ground at this point. So my three sons... And by the way, he was at Chezib, which means false, which I find interesting because it's kind of a false life that he's living. It's not real life. It's not the abundant life. It's not a great life. It's kind of a compromised life. It's kind of like the plan B or C or D or somewhere down the list. It's certainly not God's ideal situation. He's not supposed to marry the Canaanites. He's not supposed to join with them. He's not supposed to be hobnobbing with them, but he does. And yet we do the same thing, don't we? Not everything in the scripture is written for my example. It's all written for my learning, but it's not all written for my example to follow. And then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. So he grows up, becomes of age. Obviously, some years have passed. And he, Judah, takes a wife. By the way, parents used to arrange marriages. You know that, right? I remember being younger and thinking that was a terrible idea until I had children. And I said, that's a great idea. <laughs> Who chose his wife? Judah did. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Yes, that's really what it says in the original Hebrew. And Judah said to Onan... Go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass that when he went into his brother's wife, that he emitted on the ground. Lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Therefore, he killed him also. Welcome to the Bible 101. 
Yes, that's really what it says. And yes, that's really what it means. This is the first person that the Lord kills because of their sin. It's the first time. And then Onan, the second one. So out of three sons, he's only got one left. The first one goes, and it says he was wicked. It doesn't tell us what he did. It doesn't tell us why. But the Lord was displeased with him to the point where he said, I've had enough of you. And he pulled the plug. If we fast forward and go into the New Testament, we see the very same thing with Ananias and Sapphira. Where they lied to the Holy Spirit and said, yeah, we sold this property. We got a lot of money. Here's the whole batch. They said, is that the whole thing? That's the whole thing. They were keeping a bunch of it in their pocket, you know, for a rainy day. But they pretended to be something that they weren't. And the Holy Spirit took them, both of them. It seems to happen in twos. And so, killed him for being evil. Onan, now this passage has been taken out of context and used against people to speak against things like the withdrawal method of trying to uh, prevent pregnancy, uh, that's not what this is about. What this is about is the next son, who's now gotten fixed up with her, Tamar, is responsible for giving offspring to raise up for the family in his brother's name, which makes you want to be really involved when your older brother's getting married. <laughs> Dad, please, no. No, 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 find another one. That's not a good idea. And so he has to go in and have children. And by the way, when she gives birth to that child, who is the person who's going to inherit? The child. So you see, Onan would be cutting himself off from a blessing because Onan right now is the oldest living relative, male. And if he has a child and it happens to be a male, he loses that position. So it's not, about, it's not about him spilling anything. It's about him not fulfilling that which God wanted to do. And by the way, Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God, comes from Judah. So this is pretty serious stuff. God says, I, I want you to do this, and you don't want to do this. Okay, well, you're not on my plan. I'll take you out. Make another one look just like you. And so we have one marriage that doesn't win, end well. I'm glad some of you appreciate how hard I work. And so she, she then is given to the second son who is gone as well. You have no idea how hard it is. I just get mocked. It's just not fair. So th there's two sons out of three. He's given two sons to her and he's not sure exactly what's going on, but Judah says, this isn't right. And the Lord takes them prematurely. The scripture says that a fool dies before his time. A fool dies before his time. If you're going to live foolishly, you might check out before you're supposed to or before your expiration date. But then again, God is sovereign over all things and he already knows that too. And then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila is grown. Because the obligation is that he's next. For he said, lest he also die like his brother's. And Tamar went and, he, and dwelt in her father's house. Now in the process of time, the daughters of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to the sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adullamite. So we're given some interesting facts. First of all, he tells her to calm down. If ever you need to tell somebody to calm down because she's looking for the third son. Because at this point, she has nothing. She's got no inheritance, nowhere to live, no land. And in this culture, that's a big deal. She's got no way of living. There are plenty of widows and orphans who die because of such a situation. And so later on, we see it codified with Moses that you are to take care of this woman if she's in your household and the, the older dies, 
the next one takes over, as long as they're unmarried, and they raise up children. It's the way to make sure that people have social security, if you will. They have security within the family. And so he says, well, listen, whoa, 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 whoa. You've taken two of my sons already. I'm not, not sure this is a good idea. You, you need to be cool. You need to relax. You need to be serene. Sit back. Take a sedative. Uh, be self-controlled. You know, like, there's this whole list of things I'm sure he's telling her, like, let's not rush into this thing because I don't want my third son dead. You understand? It has nothing to do with how old this kid is. Or even if he's a young man. It has nothing to do with that at all. He doesn't want to lose his third son because he thinks Tamar is bad news. I mean, they call them a black widow for a reason. If you know anything about the black widow, she actually, she, she kills the male as soon as they're done procreating. And in this case, it didn't even go that far. So kind of like the black widow. And so what happens is in the midst of all this, his wife dies. And Judah is then comforted. So there's a period of mourning. And then he decides, well, that's enough. I'm going to go have a party. I'm going to go with my Dolomite buddy, my pagan pal. And we're going to go, we're going to go shear sheep. It's a, it's a great time when people get together, they shear the sheep, they make lots of money, they spend days and days out in the field. It's like, uh, I was going to say music fest, but it's not like music fest at all. It's more like Woodstock with a lot of drinking and frivolity and everybody's happy because the wolves come in and there's money flowing and alcohol. And he was told Tamar saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear the sheep. And so she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. So the jig is up. The jig is up, and she understands why it is that it's not happening. And there are lots of ways of reacting, right? Right? You can just burst into tears and you can cry or you can get extremely angry, right? And, and rebel or you could go on the offensive, do something a bit more threatening, right? So what she decides to do is, is get dressed up in all the finery of a temple prostitute and cover her face and veil her face and go sit out in an open place. You, you might... If you, if you know anything about 42nd Street, it's kind of like that. <laughs> Putting yourself in a place where everyone realizes you were for sale. And she's now going to try to seduce Judah. I know. What do you do with that? It's her father-in-law. Twice it's her father-in-law. So when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. And then he turned to her, by the way, and said, please let me come into you. Does this line work? <laughs> I mean, so nice to meet you. At least you're honest. <laughs> please let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And so she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? In other words, I can't trust your word. What's my payment? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. Yes, yeah, sure you will. But see, she knows him. And he's withholding his son, isn't he? So what's the chances he's actually going to mean what he says? Zero. And so she said, will you give me a pledge until you send it? And then he said, what pledge shall I give you? And so she said, your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. And then he gave them to her. And he went into her, and she conceived by him. Success. I read these things, and I'm looking for the hero of the story, and there's no hero. So he's deceived. You might have compassion on him. His wife died. But still, you're, you're looking for water in all the wrong places here, pal. And so he doesn't realize it, but it's his mother-in-law. It's, it's her father-in-law. 
A signet, according to staff, basically is collateral. It would be like me getting from you your wallet, your cell phone, and your car keys. The signet is something that would insignify who you are, what tribe you were, and that you were a, a person of means. Um, this, a crest, if you will, a family crest. But it would be more like your driver's license, which is a necessity for you to have on you to prove your identity. Sometimes it would be put onto a ring and you'd press it into wax to seal letters to make it official so people knew it was you who sent it. Because, you know, there's lots of people that try to change their signature to look like yours and it protects you from identity theft. And there was a cord in which it would hang around your neck and so it was like an ID that you would wear around your neck. So here's the signet, here's the cord which would be wrapped around his neck and his staff. So the signet talks about his identity, who he is, who he belongs to, his family name. His staff is a similar, it's a, a symbol of power. In fact, when Jesus has said that he would come and he would sit on the throne, it says that he would hold the scepter, which is a type of staff. And so it's, a, it's a, a sign of strength and power. And so what she wants him to do is give away his identity and his power. You go to a prostitute, that's what you do. You give away your identity and your power. You're no longer going to be the same person when it's all over. Just won't. And so she gets the goods because he can't be trusted because he's already been duplicited with her. And so she takes this in lieu of payment and her payment is a young goat. So she takes his identity and his power away. And so she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on her garments of her widowhood. And Judas sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adullamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. And then he asked the men of that place saying, where is the harlot who was here openly on the roadside? And they said, there was no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also, the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. Are you sure you weren't drinking too much? Are you sure this really happened? No, it really happened. But there is no common harlot that would be hanging out in that place, not somebody who's known for being there. In fact, she's not even from there. And so she deceives him and does a hit and run. Proverbs talks about our eyes and where we cast them. It says, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, meaning a, a prostitute or a woman who is not married to you, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. In other words, bare sustenance. You're, you're nothing more than a dollar figure. And an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. So the scripture gives us these words of wisdom to live by. If you're going to have to sell yourself or if you're going to have to buy somebody, you'll have to continue buying them for the rest of your life. And you basically are nothing more than a paycheck. Marriages are based on such things. A fair and equal exchange of commodities. But that's not what marriage is. Marriage is a covenant before God. And then Judah said, let her take them for herself. It's all right, if I don't get them back, my car keys, my wallet, my cell phone, it's okay. Lest we be shamed, for I sent this young goat and you have not found her. In other words, listen, let, let her keep it. Because if we go and we take it away from her, or if I never gave it to her, we would be liable that she would show up at any social function and suddenly put a finger in my face and I would be embarrassed. So let her, let her keep it. Maybe you'll never see her again. And boy, that'll be great. Wonderful man of real character. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child of harlotry. Everybody go, ooh, <laughs> big surprise. And so Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. 
Dude, it's harsh. So she's found, three months later, she's beginning to show, and apparently there are people who know that she's not having her regular cycle, and she's supposed to be waiting for Sheila. She's like engaged, if you will, to his son, who he would not give up, and incensed with this sense of righteous indignation, says, bring her out here and let's burn her. This is the girl he selected for his eldest and his second born. And this is also a woman he met along the way and he had intimate relationship with. And he says, let her be burned. There's no hero in this story. I'm so disappointed. He's got a serious log in his eye. Like Jesus said, Chapter 7, verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Certainly Judah had no right to say, put her to death, let's burn her. He was the guy who caused her to be pregnant. It's interesting how our sin always looks so much worse on someone else. Matthew 7, 2, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged and with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You folks are mostly old enough in the Lord Jesus Christ to understand how important forgiveness is. Number one, receiving it from God, and we remember it in communion, but also being able to give it to one another. And if you can't give it to somebody, if you can't forgive, maybe you've never been forgiven. Maybe you have not entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I would advise that you do because you will be judged with the same judgment that you use. You will be judged. Seeing people through the lens of God's grace is something that we should always do. Amen. Because God has forgiven me of a gigantic list, certainly I can forgive you of whatever evil it is that you've done to hurt my feelings, right? So, and in this world where everybody is so sensitive about everything, <laughs> let it go. It's the best therapy I could give you. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man in whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please determine whose these are, the signet, the cord, and the staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her Sheila my son and he never knew her again. Such a mix of emotions I have. She says, okay, you're gonna burn me, I get it. Um, I know you're gonna have to find the man that did this because later on Moses writes in the law, says if there's adultery and if there are witnesses and there, you, you take the man and the woman right. and they're both stoned together. That's the punishment. So I'm sure you have to find the man. You're not going to let him just get away with it, right? So here's his ID. You know, boop, boop, see if this operates his car. Here's his wallet. See if you can find his license in there. And here are his car keys. So they're both guilty. They're both guilty. And it's at that point, I think Judah has some understanding of what's going on. And he goes... Oh, I'm the guy. Like when Nathan came to David and Nathan told him a story. There's this man, he's got thousands of sheep and then there's this guy who's got one, it's a pet and his kids love it, sleeps with him and stuff. I know it's a little, a little weird, but it's a pet sheep. And the, the man who had all of these sheep went next door and took this one pet lamb and slew it for some friends that came in from out of town and had a barbecue. And David said, that man deserves to die, which is an overstatement of the punishment that should be levied. But David saw his own sin on someone else and it looked far worse on them than it did on him. And Nathan pointed the finger at David and said, you are the man. And David then repented and he was humble. And you know the story with David. And so... He says, she was more righteous than I because I did not give her my son, Sheila. He confesses. He says, you know why she did this? It's my fault. 
because I didn't do what I should do. You know, we're always so quick to blame other people for things and we don't take responsibility ourselves. Judah takes responsibility upon himself and he says, this is my fault. I essentially made her do this because I didn't give up my son, Sheila. You know what he does after this? He still doesn't give his son, Sheila. He takes personal responsibility, at least, and he says, she is more righteous than I. So if she's deserving of burning, what's he deserving of? And I think before we look at other people and judge them with such harshness, we should look inside our own souls and see if, if we've got a log hanging out. Because the psychology of it is, you tend to be really, really hard on those sins that you yourself possess on other people. It's one thing to take care of it yourself and then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And there's a repentance. It says that he never knew her again. Weird. But he didn't take her as a wife. He didn't take this relationship and take it any further. He walked away. There are no heroes in this situation here. You're going to leave this woman and, and uh, basically have her raise her kids as a single mom? That's pretty heartless. But that's what he does. But at least he's not, you know, bedding down with her. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9, John the Apostle writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not just about confessing and God forgives. It's about confessing, gaining forgiveness, and cleansing so it doesn't happen again. And only God can do that in our hearts. Only God can do that in our lives. How many of you said, I'm going to be good from now on. I'm never going to eat bread. I'm, I never have sugar. Never have a dessert ever in my life. Never. Or I got my heart broken. That's it. I'm never dating again ever. Uh, or, you know, I, whatever. Have you ever said I never ever will again something in a dramatic fashion and then it wasn't long after that you said, you idiot, what a hypocrite you are. You get pulled over and say, darn, I always go too fast on this road. That's it. I will never ever speed again. I will pay attention, sir, officer. I will never speed again. Honest, I'll never. Without the power of God to keep that covenant, it's all over because we don't have the power to do that, but God does if we commit our way to him and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness and we so need him to do that in our lives. Now, this story's not over. Now it came to pass at the time of giving birth that behold, twins were in the womb. That's because they're in the family. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, this one came out first. It's, it's an interesting race. And then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly, and she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Perez, which means breach. Like I said, have a good birth because you could get named anything. Afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was Zera. Zera means to rise. Perez means breach. So who's the eldest? The rules of this game are... <laughs> Whichever body part comes out first, that's the oldest. I don't make these rules, but I do observe them. And so he comes out first, and because of that, he gets a scarlet cord, and he's like, okay, that's all I need. You could go. Go ahead. What a gentleman. Why are we given this detail by the Holy Spirit? 
God always does amazing things, and he is very proud to be countercultural. You know, the eldest is always the one who's in charge, type A personality, you know, the one who's going to inherit a double portion of everything, and that's the culture. The interesting thing is God decides, he switches that anytime he feels like it. Jacob and Esau, did we see that happen? Ishmael and Isaac, did we see that happen? God is just picking people at random here. That's because God is God. And he doesn't submit to the rules of our culture because he's, he's God. So we just need to get on, on board. So Perez ends up being the elder. So here's Perez, by the way, handsome looking guy. The interesting thing is he's born out of wedlock, isn't he? And he's disqualified. They have names for such that I won't use here. You know you're not able to go into the temple and worship because of that? Until the 10th generation. Guess who is of the 10th generation from Perez? David, the king. There are all these little facts. Every once in a while, I'll remember to put one in. So this is Perez, who, by the way, is in the family line of Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. God is very proud to be countercultural. And there are several other women, in addition to Tamar, who are related to Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. You have Tamar, who's in this line. You have Rahab, and there happens to be a scarlet cord there too. There's Ruth, who's a Moabitess, and Bathsheba, all of which are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. You can find that in Matthew chapter one. You know, one of those long passages with names in it. There are four women that the Holy Spirit deems worthy to be put into the lineage when normally it's the father begat so-and-so, the father begat so-and-so, always the father's names. But these four names are purposely put in the book of Matthew. There are no blue bloods because Tamar is a Canaanite. Rahab is a Canaanite. Ruth is a Moabitess. Moab is, is called, God says, Moab is my wash pot. That's, that's the, the color, that's the less colorful one. It's Moab is my toilet bowl, okay? And they weren't supposed to intermarry with any of these people, and yet they do, and God works through it, doesn't he? God will work through the worst of your messes, but you will suffer for it. But God will work through the worst of your messes to, to bring glory to himself. So, what a, what a happy family we have here. <laughs> By the way, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ from Adam all the way down. You'll see Judah is here. Here's Perez. It goes down here and then it splits and it goes through. This ends up being the line of Joseph is here and Mary is here. And so both through Joseph and Mary, we have a relative of David the king so that the Messiah would be both legally born because of the father and physically born because of the mother. And so uh, all sorts of interesting things as we go through here. Then 1 Corinthians chapter 1 sums it up nicely. For you see, you're calling, brethren, not many of you wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing those things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see, that's why God chose you. Amen. Because you're imperfect because you're broken, because you might not have a great background. Hey, listen, you might not have a great performance. You might not have a great lifestyle. You might not have a lot in the bank. You might not have any great skills. All of that on your resume makes you qualified for grace, God's grace. Amen. 
And so that's the story of Judah and Tamar. Next week, we're going to get back on the stick with Joseph, and we're going to look at Joseph's temptation in chapter 39. Lots of really great lessons. I'm going to ask the worship team if they can come up. We're going to have one last song.